The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, welcome to this webinar delivered by the ISM Trust. I'm Dan Francis from Rock School. And uh, before we begin, a few technical points. You can't see us, uh, but you should be able to see the PowerPoint presentation displayed on your screen. You should also be able to hear me, but I can't hear you. If you experience any technical difficulties, such as sound or quality issues, please let us know in the question box and we'll make attempts to resolve the issue for you. Uh, if you have any questions for me related to the webinar subjects, please type them in the questions box and we'll answer as many as possible at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to view on the ISM's website at ism.org forward slash webinars. So, as I said, my name is Dan Francis. I'm the UK Education Strategy Manager for Rock School and have been since February. Prior to that, I was Head of Music Services for Buckinghamshire Learning Trust and an Assistant Head at a Multi-Academy Trust in London with specific responsibility for music. And before that, I spent 15 years or so in the classroom as a music teacher, head of department and head of faculty. And what attracted me to working uh, at Rock School was its approach to exams and awards and its overarching philosophy. Um, we're a contemporary music and dance examination board that's been operating for 26 years. And in this webinar, I'll give you a bit of an overview of who we are what we do and how our exams work as standalone qualifications to support the development of well-rounded musicians, but also how they complement other qualifications such as GCSE, A-level and our own vocational qualifications. I'll talk briefly about our teaching diplomas and our aim to support anybody looking to work and teach within the creative music industry. The presentation will last for around 40 minutes and there should be time for questions at the end. I'll also let you know how to find out more at the end of the presentation. So as indicated, 26 years, so Rock School was established in 1991 with the core aim of providing guitar, bass and drums tuition um, and having identified this as an area where formal musical exams didn't really exist as standalone qualifications. The founders, Norton York and Simon Pitt, had a desire to change this and, as it says on the screen, to bring talented, enthusiastic musicians into the education world so that young players could benefit from their experience and advice. This philosophy hasn't really changed, we've just got a bit bigger. So we are now one of the leading global uh, contemporary exam boards, delivering something like 70,000 exams a year in 44 countries and counting. We're globally recognised qualifications with uh, over 150 examiners working across the board. We've got people travelling out to China as we speak, ready to do a load of exams uh, next week. As you can see, as an awarding body, we're known as RSL Awards, Rock School Limited, because Rock School doesn't really uh, do justice to everything we do now. Um, in line with our philosophy to provide industry relevant and high, quali high quality qualifications for the creative and performing arts, as well as our graded music exams, we offer performing arts exams. These are group assessed exams in street dance, jazz dance and musical theatre and vocational qualifications, which are on the DFE performance tables. Um, in terms of our graded exams, having expanded from guitar, bass and drums, we now offer guitar, bass, drums, vocals, piano, keys, uh, popular music theory, uh, music production, and these all range from grade, debut to grade eight and beyond, and then into diploma level for both performing and teaching. Like all the other ex major exam boards, the grades have to equate to specific levels against a national qualifications framework. So grades one to three is equivalent to uh, level one, which is sort of your key stage two, three, or your age sort of eight to 13, if you like. Um, grade four to five is level two, or sort of GCSE equivalent as a, a rough rule of thumb. And grade six to eight is level three. The preliminary and debut exams we run are for entry level three, which is sort of equivalent to kind of, the, I guess, the top of, of key stage one. The difference between the performing arts exams and the graded exams is simply that the graded exams in music are assessed individually and the performing arts exams are assessed in groups. Slightly confusingly, of course, you have grade exams go from debut to grade eight and the NQF or RQF levels where they are now are level one to three. So not getting confused between levels and grades is important. And we've now got the added complexity of GCSEs not being assessed from A star to G, 
but being assessed from grade nine to grade one as well. So the terminology starts to get slightly confusing, but hopefully that will all be clear as we go through. Not that I'm gonna to talk too much about that. So that's the graded music exams from levels one to three, which is debut to grade eight. And then we have our vocational qualifications, which sit within the same framework. And these are individually examined and assessed, but are designed to be taught within the curriculum. So you can have a class of 15 or 30 students. Instead of doing a GCSE, they'll do a vocational qualification. Uh, these could be Creative and Performing Arts, or CAPA, which has a focus on theatre and dance. And then the Music Practitioner qualifications, which are on the screen in front of you, are designed for learners wanting to focus on four distinct areas of being a musician. As you can see, they perform, if you look at the pathways, performance, technology, business, and composition. And the idea is that they sit there preparing students for life in the 21st century music industry. Um, the difference between each qualification title or type is the number of hours it, it takes to complete and therefore the number of units you study. And the difference between the national qualifications framework is the level of difficulty, if you like. So you can see that the level one music practitioner is kind of what well, says pre-GCSE standard. Technically, level one, so it would be sort of a a current GCC grade one to four. Um, so kind of, if, if you like, a, a sort of the lower level of the GCC. Uh, and then the level two is kind of grade four to grade nine on the GCC standard. So what would have been an A star to C? That's the kind of level of difficulty and the level three is A level standard. Having said that, you've got the guided learning hours. So it's actually the extended certificate at level two is the direct comparison at 180 guided learning hours. That's in the second box down is equivalent to a GCSE at grades five to nine or four to nine. The level one extended certificate at 180 guided learning hours would be roughly equivalent to a GCSE at grade one to four. The subsidiary diploma at level three which is 540 guided learning hours is directly equivalent to an A level. There's obviously more information about that on our website, rslawards.com, if you really want to break down into all the details. Within that as well, you also get a list of the units. Each one has at least one compulsory unit, and then there are well over 100 optional units to cover things like group performance or working with a keyboard against a digital audio workstation or DAW which will become relevant when we look at our music production exams later on. At the moment, individual schools, colleges and alternative education providers, youth centres and so on, um, they're set up as delivery centres where nominated staff are designated to verify the standards. But there are also some great examples of schools, hubs and private teachers working together, almost like a consortium where different skill sets of the teachers are being used to deliver different units. So. The guitar teacher might well be preparing the, the student for uh, aspects of the ensemble performance. Meanwhile, the teacher in the classroom has got all the all the, the kind of has gone through the quality assurance process with us to make sure that they're fulfilling the right criteria to actually get the qualification. And so, as I said, there have been great examples of that. If you want more information, you can send me an email. My details are at the end of the uh, end of this presentation. So beyond, so we've got level one, two, and three. And beyond that, we've also got level four, which is, uh, which is a creative practitioner course. This suits anybody aspiring to work in the creative industry and is built around the concept of being a portfolio professional musician working in sort of like a gig economy. So obviously the route there is it's being designed to suit learners coming from both the creative performing arts route and the music practitioners route, which are the which are the two aspects of our vocational qualification, and you can see like the uh, like the level one, two, and three, the difference between the certificate, extended certificate, diploma, and extended diploma is the number of compulsory units you follow, so therefore the number of hours it takes to complete the qualification. Although the standard of academic rigor and difficulty is the same, and as I said, it's, it's at level four, which is. You know, sort of like foundation degree standard as a rough comparison, if you like. Within the level four arena, we've also got the teaching diploma or the DIP RSL, and that also operates at level six as well. So that's sort of, if you like, well, it's kind of within the degree area. Um, this is designed for anybody looking to gain accreditation for their learning. And you see the entry criteria, you must have completed either grade A, A-level music or a, or a B-tech or 
uh, one of our mu music practitioner vocational qualifications or a city and guilds qualification in the relevant discipline. Um, there are two units and uh, unit two, in order to complete unit, to do unit two, you have to have passed unit one. And you can see the way it's designed with it being about individual lesson delivery, uh, planning scheme work and lesson plans, and then home study plans, in other words, practice, music analysis and performance. It's designed for people who are looking to teach students, and it could well be someone who's done their grade eight and is currently at school doing their A-levels and wants to get that next level. Or it could be for someone who's at university who wants to, or at, at the Royal College, say, who is looking to uh, to get a qualification, which means they can come out the other end and say, I've got this qualification, which means I can teach. Or it could be for someone who's an existing teacher who wants recognition for the work they're already doing. Um, they sit quite nicely alongside other qualifications. Um, and uh, we're actually looking at these in quite a lot of detail to expand and broaden them a little bit more. But I'm not going to say too much more about that right now. So while the graded exams and the vocational qualifications are different in terms of their delivery, they have at the heart some core principles, which are to support high quality and genuine musical experiences, holistic learning to encourage development of instrument specific skills, conceptual understanding, and through a combination of both of these, an ability to perform and create a number of musical styles. In other words, someone that can sit down at their instrument or pick up an instrument and perform in a range of styles and understand what it is they're doing. Within that, you've got an understanding of the interrelated dimensions of music, which is a phrase of Nick from the National Curriculum. And it underpins, as I said, the National Curriculum and therefore courses at Key Stage 4 and 5 across performing, composing and listening, which is our traditional way of understanding how assessment in music works, rightly or wrongly. So let's take a little look at the National Curriculum. And that's basically what it says in a nutshell. This is a key stage three. So not a lot of it's changed since sort of 1988 when it first came in, but you see the bits in bold type we've got, including the works of the great composers and musicians. And let's hold that thought for a minute. And then you've got the interrelated dimensions, which are pitch, duration, dynamics, tempo, time, time protects the structure and appropriate musical notations. The sorts of things that we as instrumental teachers and classroom teachers would sort of hope that our young, our young children, young aspiring musicians would kind of get an understanding of. So whether we're teacher giving individual lessons or teaching in large groups or even running ensemble, it's worth bearing in mind what the national curriculum says so we can all work together to kind of to, to get children where we want them to be. If you set those disciplines there in sort of wordy form, um, against the traditional GCC and A-level uh, assessment things of performing, composing and listening, you've essentially got critical engagement. And if you can find the sweet spot in the middle of that Venn diagram, where uh, you, then you're going to get pupils developing a whole range of skills through critically engaging with music, through playing the musical instrument. And that's kind of what we're aiming for. The other way to look at that Venn diagram is to look at this table here, where you can split out the practical skills which are performing composing and the conceptual understanding which is listening and composing. So composing fits across both areas and then of course critical engagement sits over the top and you've got understanding music, listening, reviewing and evaluating music, understanding of historical periods and traditions and the interrelated dimensions. Now you could take all of those and sit at a desk and learn all of those and learn facts and figures which I'm not going to get into, uh, you know, anything political here, but you can look at those things. And, and But that's a little bit dull. But if you consider that a child has got an instrument in front of them or they've got their voice and they're exploring different styles of music, they're playing and singing and they start to create. And as they create, they start to compose. Then the bits on the left hand side kind of are all done through practical engagement in music. And then if you think about the way lots of children engage in music now, which is through music production, then I think it's very difficult to to get a sort of a distinct distinction if that's if you can say such a thing as performing and composing they're kind of doing both at the same time so let's look at the rock school graded music exams with the idea that they are designed to kind of fulfill all those criteria on the left hand side the content children do three performance pieces um, or they can do two of which may be a free choice piece, which could be their own composition if they wish, as long as it's the right sort of standard. 
And then there are technical exercises. This is uh, scales, arpeggios, recognizing chord symbols, uh, chord, um, chord voicings. Um, and then the level three qualification, so grade six to eight, you've also got band D, uh, which is the which is kind of a, a stylistic study as well. So you have to be able to demonstrate you can you can play in particular styles. Then you've got sight reading or improvisation and interpretation for debut in grade five, debut to grade five. By the time you get to grade six, seven and eight, which is your level three or A level equivalent standard, it turns into a quick study piece, which is where there's a bit of sight reading and there's a bit of improvisation at the same time. So you're kind of combining those two disciplines together, showing you're a fully rounded musician. And then there's two ear tests, the oral tests, and then five general musicianship questions. And these are these are five questions based on one of the pieces that are performed, which are designed to kind of test your your conceptual understanding of the piece, the contextual uh, understanding of it. And on the right hand side, you can see the percentages of what each of those are worth. If we then, uh, how are we doing? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Sorry. If we if we then take the graded music exams and look at how they support holistic progress, what you've got there on the left hand side is level one, level two, and level three, or if you like, the key stage two, three, GCC equivalent, and A level equivalent. And then you can see how the diff the performing, composing, and listening all fit together to uh, are all kind of covered by the graded music exams through the performance pieces, which is obviously about solo and ensemble performing skill. Sight reading and interpretation, quick study pieces, that's a great route into composition, impro improvisation, into composing your own piece of music. It's a fairly obvious kind of transition there. Uh, the technical exercises are about instrument specific skills and music theory. As I said, the general musicianship is about musical understanding. And then your ear tests are about kind of developing listening. So, what I particularly like about the Rock School stuff is that everything you need is contained in one book. And there are fact files, which give wider context to each piece. And then there are walkthroughs, which break the piece down into specific sections and give guidance as to how you might play them, but also what you're being assessed on in each section. And then you've also got the full score. Now you can see there, this basket case, which I think is guitar grade three. Uh, you've got the sections labeled A and B, you've got repeats, you've got the chord chart, you've got the actual notation and you've got the tab. So there are different routes in for the for the student to learn, depending on, on what their own particular discipline is. And obviously the ideal is that you're kind of using a combination of all three so they become really familiar. And then also within the book, you've got complete exam preparations. There's no need to buy additional books because you've got the technical exercises, examples of sight reading and improvisation tasks, Examples of the general musicianship questions and the ear tests. And then the last few pages include the marking criteria and instrument specific uh, guidance, such as how to control the tone in your guitar or specific techniques like paradiddles and flams and hammer on and pull offs and so on. Um, there's more about that uh, in a bit. So before we go into a little bit more detail, I put here on the left an example of the first page of Long and Winding Road by the Beatles, which is in the grade one book. And before I talk a bit more about it, well, in fact, no, I'm going to talk a bit more about it before we hear the full track. Now, if you look at it on the left hand side there, you can see there looks like there's some fairly complex things in terms of, you know, for grade one. This is, a, this is potentially a student that's sort of age seven or eight. There's syncopation in there, um, some interesting sort of slash chords and, and F7s and so on. And then on the last line, you've got kind of that, that quaver, semi quaver figure with the slur underneath. All of that potentially looks quite tricky but if you regard it as uh, if you start from a point of view that's an oral tradition and you listen to it then the student picks up how it sounds and then they can equate what they're hearing to what they see on the page which is very much as part of the philosophy of how we learn language we listen to it we learn to speak it and then of course we learn to read it and write it down and if you work as that as a first principle it really works quite nicely and of course the pieces of music which the students recognize and know and can engage with straight away so let's just hear it <laughs> Thank you. 
carries on. And within that, you've got the opportunity to talk about the, the motivic development, the riffs. You've got the opportunity to talk about the additional flats in there, which if you really wanted to get down and dirty with the E flat, you could talk about the, the seventh and possibly links to its tradition in blues and jazz and so on. Depends how much detail you want to go into and obviously depending on the age of the child and what they're able to uh, able to cope with. But equally, you've got things organised into neat four bar phrases and so on and so forth. On the right hand side, I put uh, the piano grade A quick study piece. There are three different ones. Um, here you've got musical theatre. So this is designed for a, a student to be able to come in and, and uh, demonstrate they understand everything there is to know about playing as a musical theatre pianist or playing in a particular style. You can see that, the, the, that there's significantly more detail in terms of the in terms of the sort of the dynamics and articulation and the key. Um, but there's an element at the beginning where you've got to play a, a set phrase and then you've got to improvise a, a section in the middle and that obviously is an opportunity for the child to demonstrate that they can that they can uh, they, they can refer to kind of particular phrases. They can they can play for, for a set amount of time, or they can play in a particular sense of style. And the idea really is that from the beginning, when they're learning how to play a piece of music by the Beatles, which is from a, you know they can listen to the backing track and the full track and replicate it as best they can. They then get to the point by the time we get to grade eight, where you can say here's a style of music, and they know all they need to know practically and conceptually to be able to play in that style. So we're helping them through the exams become a fully fledged, well-rounded musician. Let's just, can we just, hang on a minute, we need to bypass that for one second. Don't want to play that again. That's what we want to do. So if we have a look at the assessment criteria. Um, all of this is available on the website. Um, and this is just an example of the performance piece assessment criteria. And what we've done is made sure that the criteria itself is the same for every instrument across every grade, which means essentially we're encouraging a consistency of approach so that irrespective of the instrument, pupils can become increasingly skilled musicians. Now, if you look back at the previous page, it's been pointed out to me on, on a number of occasions, there's no dynamics written in there. Well, that's fine. Because actually one of the things we're looking to assess is the student's ability to uh, take the piece of music and add their own stylistic interpretation. And as you can see, for the distinction grade descriptor, a highly confident and assured presentation. That is somebody that has taken the piece of music and they've got inside the piece of music and knows how to turn it into something that is musical rather than simply just playing the, dot, the dots that are on the page. And I think that's a really, really important thing to bear in mind. Um, obviously, as the grades go up, the exams get longer due to the content. It's not just as you get better at playing your instrument, you have to play for longer. It's just there's more to assess. So these are the exam times for information. You can see the full exam there. The debut is 15 minutes. Um, and then you've got the performance certificate, which is the same level as the full exam, but instead of doing three pieces and then the technical exercises and so on, you simply take five pieces of music, so you end up with a performance certificate. And then on the right hand side is the music production exam, which is done slightly differently. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Here's a little bit more information about the, 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 the whys and wherefores of the pieces being a bit longer. So let's look at this is, uh, this is latch um, and it's grade two. The piece lasts up to a maximum of a minute and a half. And here it's the case of showing that the student can concentrate on, on the notation accuracy, sound tone control, articulation and sync or synchronization, essentially coordination of the hands against the, against the music in the background. Really important both as a soloist, but actually it's good preparation for playing as part of an ensemble as well, even if the ensemble happens to be recorded. Then you've got grade five, so it goes up to two and a half minutes. And here you've got a little bit more about stylistic techniques, a bit more advanced technical control, and you're starting to get developing solo and improvisation elements. Bear in mind that, that grade five is, is equivalent to GCSE. So of course you can take these tracks and use them as submissions for your GCSE should you want to. And actually you can download them individually from the website. Um, you get the full track, you get the backing track and you get the PDF of the score. So it satisfies your GCSE submission criteria across all the exam boards, which I think is an important thing to chuck in as an additional 
extra bonus. Let's move through to grade eight, which is obviously your top end at A level. So it's pretty advanced. Three minutes and 45 seconds long. And here you really show mastery of the instrument. Complex notation, execution of stylistic technique, technical control, mature and creative solo and improvisation elements. And those of you that are really embedded with the pedagogy of learning will know that creativity is at the top of Bloom's taxonomy, which is kind of like what you want to be able to, what you want to get everybody to, to go towards. Um, and of course, I've got a clear sense of ownership and communication of the music through performance, which is what I was talking about uh, a minute or so ago. I just want to take a minute now to talk about the audio that accompanies each piece, as these are kind of key to our exams. Uh, we constantly refresh the exams to keep them up to date. We've just launched our new guitar, bass and drums exam syllabus. Um, and the tracks were recorded by professional musicians at Real World Studios, which you can see is Peter Gabriel's studios. We have musicians such as Andy Jones, who played at our launch for guitar, bass and drums last week. He's played with Queen, Van Morrison, heavily involved in the production of uh, and, and We Will Rock You, the musical. And John Isley, who played on the original Dar Straits recordings, and as well as our own arrangement uh, of Salt and the Swing, done for our own graded exams. You can see Billy Cobham, who is regarded as one of the best drummers of all time, and Paul Elliott, who is the drummer that people go to if they really want to perfect their, their drumming technique. Also, our syllabus manager, the guy responsible for kind of writing a significant amount of our qualifications with is John O'Harrison, who was playing the keyboards. Um, part of the refresh of our exam is to make sure that we're covering as many classic and new genres as possible. And together with the fact files, this also helps students development of conceptual understanding and the works of the great composers over time. If you remember from the National Curriculum document, so we've got blues, rock, pop, soul, funk, punk rock, grime, reggae, jazz fusion, loads of different styles coming through. And I think there's nothing wrong with saying that actually, when it comes to historical time periods and great composers, that we're talking about a significant, uh, you know, a significant amount of pop music culture, as well as classical culture as well. And it's important that we, we consider this. Um, here's a reminder of how the graded exams support holistic progress. So you can see, hopefully, that the underlying principles of our constant exam syllabus development and then within this, I want to take a moment to introduce the music production exam as it's a bit different and is unique to us. There it is. So it runs from grades one to eight. And we're really excited that, that over the course of this term, we're introducing a coursework edition of the music production, um, which covers the practical assessment. So if you have a look, um, it's similar to the graded music exams in that you've got the theoretical written exam and the listening tests are similar, uh, are testing the similar sorts of skills as, as the oral tests and um, the, the technical studies. This is kind of really making sure that the conceptual understanding of what you've done practically um, is there and it's understood. The technical skills in the professional scenario is when you're given, uh, you're given a, a coursework task essentially that you need to complete by interacting with a digital audio workstation. So something like uh, Cubase or Foundation or Soundtrap, something along those lines, Ableton, I must mention all of them, there are loads. Um, and and you're, you're basically sitting there at your computer producing music as you would if you're sitting at a piano or, or playing your flute or playing your violin and you create a piece of coursework uh, which you then upload to a secure portal, which is then assessed externally. And that represents 60% of your exam in the same way that the three performance pieces represent 60% of your total exam for the graded music exams. Just to break it down a bit further, on the right hand side, you can see that there's the, well, there's the learning objectives on the left and the one, two, three and four. And then on the right, you've got the different parts of the exam, a bit of theory and a bit of a written exam and then the practical exam. Um, and, and as I said, the exams last for, if it's grades one to three, it will last for 45 minutes. That'd be the theory I've written, which is a case of going to an exam centre, uh, potentially with your own laptop or to a, a, a centre that's got a computer with an internet connection, um, taking work, uploading it to a secure portal, that's a practical bit done, and then sitting and going through the theory page theory paper and the listening paper, demonstrating the different things which are everything from key terminology, so understanding the musical language you're using, understanding sound and audio in relation to modern music production. So that's um, getting inside a piece, of, a, a, a piece of modern music and understand how it's being recorded and reproduced. Demonstrating effective listening skills relevant to modern music production, 
what you need to be a music musician, irrespective of what instrument you happen to be engaging with, whether it's a digital audio workstation or, or a door, a DAW, or a piano, or a guitar, or a violin. You need a decent pair of ears to listen to what you're doing, but also to listen to what's going on around you to make sure it all fits together. And if you can do that, and if you're doing it through music, through music technology, then you're going to demonstrate effective music production techniques, which is everything from knowing how to take your music from your own computer and share it with others, all the way through to taking professional scenario and interpreting what someone else wants you to produce and then being able to recreate it and making it sound good. Um, one of the issues can be that engagement with music production and technology doesn't develop the same level of musical skill. But I kind of disagree with this. And we've got to bear in mind that this is how children engage with music from their first access point. Now, um, music, whether it comes to sort of listening to music through Spotify, YouTube, and basically music being streamed, or whether it's sitting there with your with your tablet, which they've got in school, which has got GarageBand preloaded onto it, they're starting to engage and fiddle around with different bits of music. And really the idea is, like with all our other exams, is that is that the music production exam is providing accreditation for the musical work they're already engaging with and um, uh, and that what you're doing is sort of almost backfilling or helping the children to understand the musical skills and the music production skills they're developing at the same time and you can see that on the left I've kind of tried to strip out some of the generic musical skills that you might develop with performing composition and listening at the top because you're doing those things as you're working on your computer and then the right hand side kind of processes and way which are demonstrating that. So, for example, if you're working on a computer and you've got a piece of you've got a sample that or you've recorded a guitar track and you're, you're or a vocal track and you're looking at the EQ, you're looking at whether it's treble, mid or bass, you're looking at whether it's pan to the right or to the left. All of those things are actually you developing an understanding of dynamics and balance because where you place them in the mix. Is, has a, a fundamental difference in terms of how loud it sounds compared to another instrument. It's also worth bearing in mind that the major exam boards have ensured that the skills students get from engaging music production complement and support progression onto GCSE and A-level, and it's actually written into their specifications. But even if you look at it on a more informal basis, you can look on the left-hand side, GCSE, one of the performance criteria, perform with technical control, expression and interpretation. Well, you can do that if you can, if you're going to have a, a MIDI controller keyboard attached to your computer, you're going to need to be able to perform in time and properly in order to be able to make it sound good. Likewise, composing and developing musical ideas with technical control and coherence. As you're putting samples together and creating your own samples, you have to have a pair of ears that are going to make sure that they fit together and they work properly. Demonstrating the applied musical knowledge, knowing that you want the intro to be there and the verse to be there and the drop to be there and you want that bit to be 30 seconds or eight bars long, is all the sort of conceptual musical understanding which you also develop through getting inside your graded uh, performance piece of grade four on the bass guitar. So you can see how we've kind of worked quite hard to make sure it maps across really quite nicely. And in, in actual fact, the music production exam, as it stands, is not that dissimilar to the A-level music technology exam at grade six, seven and eight. So as I said at the start, Rock School is about providing accreditation that will prepare students for the world of work. And I like the idea that students can engage with music through playing a violin or through being the sound engineer for a concert or play the piano and develop the skills that are going to enable them to be an effective session musician or know what to do when they walk into a recording studio. And I think it's worth bearing in mind that every student we're working with um, is actually going to be potentially contributing to the creative music industry, which UK Music in 2017 in the Measuring Music Report, identified that it contributes at that point 4.4 billion to the UK's GDP. I think that's gone up. There's also a 13% increase in music exports, 5% increase in recorded music. And with sort of Brexit on the doorstep, it's actually really important to recognise that, that music is one of the UK's biggest exports and, and, and a massive con contribution to, uh, to GDP, or not just music, but the creative arts as a whole. From an educational point of view, advocating for why music should be done in schools, well, the, the, these sorts of exams complement the existing arts awards and DV and the EPQ, the Extended Professional Qualification, 
Um, and then you've got at grades six, seven and eight, um, they actually represent eight to 30 UCAS points. So if you get a distinction at grade eight, you've got 30 university entrance points. And it contributes to the whole school's progress eight measure. This is the way that schools measure their progress in the level two and at level three. And of course, it provides a great way of, of, um, of engaging with the community and engaging with, with students and, and adults, even and young people who wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily think traditionally engaged with music. And if you put a violin in the hand, they may not want to be particularly engaged with a violin, but they're all right because they've already got high level of skill in music production. So, you know, let's 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 jump on that and let's support that one. And of course, it can support primary provision as well, because within a within a primary school environment, you've got lots of schools that already own a whole set of instruments through tablets or through PCs and then you can engage with cloud based DAWs and you can actually do whole class musical learning through uh, through music technology. So this slide basically is kind of is clarifying a little bit more about that. I mean, there's a lot of concern about the erosion of music education. And I think one thing that we can do as professionals is to highlight that doing the graded music exam um, in music production or guitar or violin or flute or any of them and doing GCC or A level, it's not an either or situation, but they actually do complement each other quite nicely, as you can see. From the top two there supports the curriculum where you can just take the repertoire that we've got from bot school and use it as a high quality resource in the classroom and as i said before you can take it and use it as coursework or exam material and you can actually prepare your grade prepare for your graded music exam and you can also submit that as part of your solo performance at the same time um i've highlighted the fact that rock school complement learning at key stage three four and five talked about the fact you can use free choice pieces as part of your rock school exam and of course, you've got the link between curricula and extracurricular learning, which I can, I'll show you a diagram in a minute. And then with the whole school benefit to advocate for why music, why, why we should support children and learn musical instruments, either whole classes, small groups or individually. Because by the time you get to, to, to grade six, seven and eight, they get UCAS points. And as I said before, it can be used for the whole school progress eight measure in the what's known as the open bucket. Um, this is a little uh, indication. I think it's really important that we uh, that, that we recognise how engagement in music inside and outside the classroom kind of feeds each other. There can be a sort of a traditional. I mean, I've noted there's a, 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 a in many places there's a traditional thing where if you're playing a musical instrument to a certain standard, it might well often sit completely outside the classroom and and never the twain should meet. Well, that's fine. Continue making music through extracurricular music uh, or your extracurricular lessons. But you've got the progression when you do the whole class ensemble teaching or whole class engagement at key stage two and three. It could then lead on to progressing on to playing and having individual small group lessons. And likewise, as I said, the performance work you're doing, the composition work you're doing, the general musicianship work you're doing in your instrumental lessons helps feed into your level two VQ, vocational qualification learning and GCC. And of course, the same thing at key stage five. And you can kind of drop in and out at any of those different points according to what is appropriate for a particular child itself. To go into a bit more detail, here's a map as the whole UK education picture as a whole. So you've got on the left, you've got the RQF levels, E1, 2 and 3, and then levels 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 8. The difference in Scotland is that E1, 2 and 3 is, is just level 1, 2 and 3. Uh, so you just add 3 and you get, so in Scotland it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And the RQF, the RQF sort of uh, levels 4 to 6 are kind of like your degree. And then key stage 5, which is A levels or the T levels of developing or the top end of your VQs. And then you've got level 2, which is your G to C grades 9 to 4, what was A start to C. And, uh, and then level one, which is uh, GCC grades three to one uh, and a bit of key stage three and the top end of key stage two as well. And then you've got the apprenticeship picture, which is in there as well. And a lot of what we're doing with our vocational qualifications is to help people develop, to sort of have a, a modular approach to learning. So they may well use bits of those modules to help support them as they're engaged in the apprenticeship in a professional organization. And you can see on the right hand side, you can see how our graded music exams kind of map across to the different key stages and the RQF levels and feed into GCCs and A levels and degree and so on and so forth. That is assuming, of course, that you start doing grade one 
when you're at you know in year four at primary school now we know that many people start doing grade one earlier than that or later than that and that's absolutely fine as long as you've got a sense of what level you're working at and kind of what it feeds into and how they complement each other and i think if we're able to do that as professional musicians and have that in mind as we're developing all the qualifications and awarding body then i think we're going to be in we are in a good place to help support the ongoing uh, development of of children musically in this country and we are and remain to be and will continue to be the envy of the world in that regard um there's now time uh, to take a few questions. Um, if you want to know a bit more about the ISM, then you can visit ism.org and the ismtrust.org. And then uh, if you want to find a bit more information from us directly, then you can go to the RSL website and give you information about that just now. So that's my email address and the central office phone number. And of course, if you visit www.rslawards.com, you can get uh, detailed information about everything I've talked about, including uh, syllabus uh, documents. And you can even go to the shop and start downloading the individual tracks and buy the books and all sorts of stuff as well, which I think is important for me to say um, so that my CEO remains happy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Um, so on to questions. Our first question from Emily. What's the rationale for teaching an oral tradition through notation? Is the notation optional? Accuracy does appear on the assessment criteria, so it probably isn't optional. Okay, so the rationale for teaching an oral, well, the rationale isn't that we're teaching an oral tradition through notation. The rationale is that we're teaching an oral tradition and we're helping children get, or students or learners, candidates, whichever word you want to use, um, get an accredited qualification for their ability to perform a piece of music. I think we'd be doing people a disservice if we didn't use the opportunity to help them become familiar with appropriate notations. And it's appropriate notations in the same way that it's appropriate notations at GCSE and A level, which could of course be in the lights of music production could be a waveform. And I think it's important that they know that, that students now can read a waveform and decipher that as they can decipher a crotchet and a quaver. The accuracy comes down to how well they perform the melody in line with how the melody should sound. So I think it is important that if it's meant to be a crotchet, that it's a crotchet, or to put it another way, if the note falls on beat four, that it fits on beat, sits on beat four. But likewise, if you're playing a jazz piece, you know, a note that sits on beat four of the bar actually generally is pushed, so it'll be a little bit ahead of the beat, which shows stylistic awareness. So if you actually played it absolutely as a notation of said, for example, you didn't swing the quavers, then you, you potentially lose marks because of a lack of stylistic awareness. So it's really not a case of, if I play the music as it's written, I'm going to get top marks. Okay, thank you. Um, another question from Emily. The open group of the Progress 8 Book It seems to be quite volatile with some qualifications like VCERT and NCFE falling in and out. Given the challenges of changing syllabus mid-course, are the practitioner and production courses likely to stay? Yes, until 2020 okay. is the short answer to that, at least. And then we would anticipate beyond that as well. But you're right, it is a volatile market. And it's something that we we look very we look at very, very carefully. It's actually part of my role within the organization to look at how that, that fits together. But yeah, our our um our courses are sitting there on the performance tables uh, until at least 2020. Are there any more questions? You're welcome, Emily. You're welcome, Alistair. Okay, thank you very much. So as I said, if you want any more information about anything I've talked about, you can email me directly, danfrancis at rslawards.com, or for more general information, visit www.rslawards.com or ism.org to find out more about the, the, the webinar series and other ongoing, uh, on, other ongoing training. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>